Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast, where we interview the world's top experts that allow you to live your greatest life in your greatest body. And today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Andy Galpin, and you guys are going to love this gentleman. He is literally the guy on the cutting edge when it comes to research and performance when it comes to muscle building. So Andy is studying some things that I didn't know were being studied anywhere on the planet, including muscle fiber type training, how to specifically train for specific fiber types. You're going to want to listen to exactly what Andy's doing, literally pulling out one muscle fiber at a type and looking at the signaling that's going on in your training. We also talk a lot about fat loss and maybe some of the misconceptions. We talk a little bit about maybe the misconceptions and misunderstandings in current day research, some of the shortcomings. We also talk about lactate and what you don't know about lactate. And Andy gives us a really awesome synopsis toward the end of the podcast on what you need to know about lactate and how to use that to your advantage and so much more. This was an awesome interview I did at the Fitness Business Summit in San Diego this weekend, and I'm really excited to bring it to you. And if you love it as much as I do, give Andy a shout out on social media, Dr. Andy Galpin, and also give us a share and leave us a review because we love you. Enjoy the show. Hey guys, I interrupt this podcast to bring you a special announcement from me and the MI40 Nation. So for the last year, I've been working on something that's going to change the fitness industry. So everyone that's listening to this podcast exercises, everybody works out. Um, but typically we learn from the people on YouTube, the thing, the people who we most admire and most want to be like, and that's a massive mistake. That's limiting your progress, limiting your ability to build muscle. What you need to do is you need to learn how to train for your body type. And I've just released something called hypertrophy execution mastery. So, uh, basically, I'm going to give you everything I've learned over the last 20 years uh, to optimize execution for your body and some simple concepts that you can take away and apply to every single exercise you do to not only make it fit your body, but make it maximally effective for your body. Because we don't want to just be training. We want to be getting the most out of our training. I attach to getting the most out of the least. I don't want to be in the gym for two hours anymore. I want to be in there for 40 minutes. I want to crush it. I want to go home with the maximum amount of results or maximum amount of response and an S on my chest, knowing that I got the job done that I set out to achieve. So if you guys want to check this out, it's going to revolutionize the way you work out. Hypertrophymastery.com. You're going to absolutely love it. And I appreciate your support. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. What's up, ladies and gents? Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast. I'm standing here at the Fitness Business Summit in San Diego, California with Dr. Andy Galpin flexing his pipes. So we just finished a podcast with Barbell Shrug. And Dr. Andy is actually one of the co-hosts there now. And he's been so gracious to join us here on the Muscle Expert Podcast because he's awesome and he's doing great research. And I've been trying to bug him to get him on here for six months, but he's been, you know, just been ignoring me a little I'm bit. I'm in big time him. <laughs> yeah, he's been big time me a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, graciously, he's been able to join us. And uh, we've been standing here talking for literally the last couple hours about what we're going to talk about to really give you guys some really great golden nuggets. Yeah. Uh, and it's going to start off with something that is near and dear to Dr. Andy's heart, muscle fiber type training. So he's doing some really interesting research out of his lab here in Cal State Fullerton. Yep. Um, and uh, tell us about it. So we have a pretty unique ability to take muscle biopsies. So with every athlete that comes in or person, we take a little piece of a so, needle. So just so you yeah. know what a muscle biopsy is, he actually has a garden hose that he carries around with him everywhere he goes. And he, he starts from about 15 feet away and he runs from the other side of the room and shoves it into your thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, I do know somebody who's a pretty elite level bodybuilder one time. That... <laughs> I'm like, there's no way. I like my quads too much. Uh, so we, we biopsy. We what go on. it, 18-inch needle? No, that's not really how it works. Tell me what it is. Uh, it doesn't really work in inches. It's it's only like the size of a pen, so it's not too bad. <laughs> 18 gauge though, like no. What, no, we have different gauge. It's not. It's a, it's a different gauge system. Okay. It doesn't even work on that system. It's okay. a, it's more like a five millimeter thing, but that doesn't even. So, but how much how much depth is that? Not that I'm trying to. It probably it goes. Um, it it probably goes that far in. But yeah, but how? Someone to you would go be half that far. We'll put it this way. We get about uh, the size of an eraser. 
and muscle that comes out. So a pea, the end of your, not even half your pinky, so, I mean, tiny it's bit. It's literally a garden hose going into your No, body. it's not. Okay, pretty close. It's, it's a little so, bit. So you're not selling me, man, here. You're not selling me. Do, well, I, do I at least get like a shot of Jack Daniels before going there or something? Or? If, you, if, if that's what it takes, sweetheart. No, no. That's, that's what it takes. No, I'm, that's I'm, fine. I'm a cheap drunk man. We don't need to do that. No, so. Uh, I, I won't be a volunteer. But hey, man, if anybody wants to volunteer to do a muscle biopsy at Dr. Andy's lab, I'm sure he wants you. I'm yeah, don't talk to him about <laughs> it. Do me. Um, um, so we, what we do is, the reason we do that is because we study muscle at the cellular and right, genetic level. Right. right. So all the way down, what we do is it's called whole body to gene. Yep. So I want to know how strong you are, how much you squat, how fast you can sprint and right. jump. I also want to know what the individual cells. So you're quantifying you're that. You're, you're, the whole you're, way down. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So we, we, we do that. And then what we do that is special is we then go analyze that tissue one muscle fiber at a time. So we literally put it underneath the microscope and then you got thousands of fibers in that sample and I pull one out with, the, with tweezers and we analyze and do all of our studies on those one cell at a time. We can analyze the molecules in them. We go all the way down and do the genes uh, that look to answer our question. And what we do is different is most labs that can do research kind of like that, study disease treatment, prevention, management stuff, we study the opposite end of the spectrum, which is performance, man. Uh, and so I'm trying to figure out what do these elite level athletes look like, whether they're uh, MMA fighters or bodybuilders or powerlifters, weightlifters. We've recently biopsied a whole bunch of world champion Olympic gold medalist uh, weightlifters. So this is Olympic weightlifting. Mm -hmm. uh, females, males. Uh, we're one of the few that study females too, which is pretty interesting because their physiology is quite different. Right. And muscle is different. So we then take it to our lab and we're able to measure any of these things you've heard of, mTOR, like AMPK, all this stuff, any of these signaling proteins that then control the regulation of muscle growth, atrophy, shrinking, any of this stuff. And we measure it at that single cell level. Uh, and so what we've probably become most famous for is fiber typing. Yeah. Uh, fast twitch, slow twitch. It gets a lot more complicated than that. Yes, it does. Uh, and we're one, of the, one of the reasons people know that is because of because of us. Uh, we put so much research out there on what it really looks like, that whole spectrum, how they do change with training. And so our next big adventure is trying to figure out, answer this question of fiber type specific hypertrophy. Right. So you know, you and your community, the bodybuilding world has, has taught us for so many years that different types of training, different rep ranges, activate different fiber types. And I've always asked the question like, is that really true? But I don't really know. Uh, right. And now we have the technology that we're able to do this in the machine. We have the automation we have that we can analyze all these proteins on one muscle fiber at a time. We can finally answer this question. We've never been able to do it before. Right. We're the only ones that can do this kind of level of fiber typing. And we're the only ones that can measure the proteins like this. And now that we can do them together, we can get a very quickly, we can answer this question for the first time. How much does the type of training influence your... Composition. Everything from that, right? And so ideally what we'd like to get to is something like, okay, you've identified you're more of a fast twitch guy or a fast, a slow twitch girl. Therefore, maybe your volume needs to be a little bit different because you have a different fiber type or the opposite. But it would be one of the two. But what we're really getting at is more individualized, personalized training prescription. I understand. I, I don't, I feel like that would be a long road to make deductions, right? Because you're like, Absolutely. Hey, hey, man, I see you have this. But I have no idea what that means for your training. Does it just because I have more fast twitch muscle fibers? Doesn't does that mean that I should be training more? That's that's the beauty of it, right? It, it could be one or the other. Right. We don't know. It could be the opposite direction. It could mean the opposite, right? So it could be say you're too relying on this. You need to train the other. So how influence? How, how much can you influence fiber type with training? Like from your oh, experience? a tremendous amount. Right. So let's talk about that. So uh, we actually have some data from some of the NASA stuff we've done with the astronauts that fiber type changes in ten days. And that's pretty extreme. Yeah. On planet Earth, you're talking easily 30 days. We've seen fiber type changes in as little as 30 days, no doubt. Right. Uh, we've seen it, and people hear weird things about this, but some people think you can't go from fast to slow or something like that. Right. You, you can go up and down the whole spectrum. Uh, in fact, we've done uh, a twin study. So there's two monozygous twins, which means they have the exact same DNA. Yep. They're clones, yep. right? And up to age 18, they were basically the same. And then for the next 30 years, one of them stopped training. The other one kept doing Ironmans, uh, triathlons, things like that, yep. right? So we have a 30-year training difference, sedentary, 30 years train. The sedentary guy was about 50-50, fast twitch, slow twitch. The trained guy was 90 plus percent slow twitch. Wow. So you want to know how much you can change? It's infinite. It only comes down to time and exposure. 
it's amazing. The more time you give something, the more exposure you give to it to a stimulus or a lack of stimulus, right. the more change you get. So you literally, there is no limit to how far it will change if given enough time. The only limit is how long you live. Yeah, so it's funny because I did a, I told you I did a hike yesterday. There was a, yeah. you know, effectively almost a 10-hour hike. And the whole time going through my mind, I was thinking about what was happening at my, you know, physiological level. Like, of course you are, because that's, <laughs> that's what everybody thinks Yeah, about. of course. Like, You're not going, enjoying I'm, nature. I'm, You're just... Well, I was enjoying nature, too. Yeah. But, I, you know, I would kind of go through 10 hours and need a lot of time to think. So I was going through in my mind, um, literally, I'm detraining my fast twitch muscle fibers right now. Probably. Yeah. And yeah. I've spent so many years, and I really believe if you want to build your greatest body, you want to be training fast twitch muscle fibers. Like, you're yeah. trying to get your body to convert. I'd love to see some some muscle biopsies and bodybuilders other than myself, of course. <laughs> I'd love to see, like, you know, when I was at my peak, what percentage had I shifted to? Because yeah. the, the better, the harder I trained, the better I got, I got at training, the better I got at aggressively contracting muscles, the easier it was for me to get in shape. So, you know. It's, bodybuilding is really hard because with weightlifting and powerlifting, we know that answer. Uh, we biopsied enough of those folks. They're 80, 90 plus percent fast twitch. Wow. I mean, and they're huge. We actually have biopsied one guy who I can't say, a mm -hmm. uh, very no, well-known powerlifter, a lot of years of testosterone use and other steroids, and his fibers were about three times bigger than anyone's I've ever seen. He's not a bodybuilder at all, but he went through a little bit of that in his career too. So I would really love to know what's a real bodybuilder look like. Have you like. done any bodybuilders? We haven't done hardly any oh, bodybuilders. I volunteer. As much as I No, say, you won't. As much, <laughs> now you're going to throw it out there now. Yeah. You won't do that. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see Let's if see. he does it. Well, Hold him to although it. Although I don't know if I'd call myself a bodybuilder anymore, man. I haven't trained. I haven't trained like a bodybuilder in eighteen months. Yeah, but it's still close enough. I mean, that's going to change, but you're still going to have the hypertrophy of the fibers. So still over be the around. next three months, I'm actually going to start doing some bodybuilding training again. I'm going to do. We it. should pre-post you. Oh, okay, let's do it. Yeah, come so, out. So I get you're already two here. Two holes in my leg instead. Drive of up today. I got to fly out in the morning. Oh man. yeah, convenient. You, I got to fly out. Yeah, I'd love to. We're but... going to bring Andy down to Tampa with, uh, with his garden hose to take a big chunk of my thigh yeah. and it might actually go into a museum one day because you know that's, that's a valuable quad right but that's one of the other things we can do is we've got a really fancy microscope it's a laser actually and we can image the fiber in 3d so we get a 360 wow. degree dimension of the fiber we can look at the size and then we can actually tag it for what's called the nuclei so the nuclei are the yeah. hold your dna right yeah most people don't realize you have thousands of nuclei per cell so we can count that we could figure out how many nuclei you have. Uh, most people are aware that, particularly with testosterone use, stem cells come up, you have more, more nuclei. Yeah. Why that's a benefit is because each nuclei then controls a smaller area. It's called the mononuclear domain, right? That means you can recover faster. Yes. You can grow more, right? So right. the amount of, at some point, the amount of fiber size you have is limited by the amount of nuclei you have. Sure. If you can increase that number, theoretically, you could get higher. So we can capture all this stuff in a fiber type specific fashion. We just haven't gotten, like we're working our way. We just haven't gotten yeah, any bodybuilders so yet. Talk about any, so I, I taught this stuff. In 2013, I put, came out a program that I found was best for, you know, through research. I mean, you may have seen the research from Dr. Antonio. Sure. With, with the yeah. interset stretching stuff. Mm -hmm. So I created a protocol that was literally mind blowing with the amount of hypertrophy I saw. Like, yeah. So we did a six week study and we saw an average of 16 pounds of muscle gain amongst the 30 studies. That's crazy. That's, that's crazy. Average. It's yeah. crazy. Um, it was hard, yeah, yeah. Uh, but intentionally just focusing on this interset stretching protocol. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. And, and I, I'd be curious to hear your opinion on the type of training necessary to get the greatest number of nuclei. Is it just <sighs> stress? Is it just... Man, I would love to give you an answer there, but I'd be, I'm totally guessing. Yeah. Because we have... We're still trying to figure the nuclei thing out. Uh, it's not as simple as what I just laid out. You're right. There, there is some contracting data in there. So I, I, don't, I don't know, man. I would have to guess and say it's probably a combination of high volume, low volume stuff. Right. So knowing what you know, I mean, obviously there, there's nobody better in the world right now to make it make an educated guess. Would it be oxygen deprivation so that you're actually going to have to recruit more fast twitch? Is it going to be stem cells? Is yeah. it going to be... Man, like <laughs> I'm going to have to say I don't know again. Okay. It's really, really tough to figure out. We're still trying to figure out the mechanisms of hypertrophy to begin with. Right. 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 Now we're a lot closer, but... Whenever I feel like every time we stumble on something, we're like, okay, this is it. And then we yeah, come and do enough and we're like, well, shit, okay, that's not really doing so it So talk either. about that. And, you know, we didn't plan on that, but talk about the mechanism of virtue that, that at least we think to be most accurate. Well, the, 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 the metabolic stress one is one that's coming under fire right now because that was one that we we're pretty sure on for a while, right? right? Now it's like, okay, that, so there's something there. I mean, the blood flow restriction stuff, that was undeniable. And now it's like, okay, there's something there. We know that mechanical damage 
there is a relationship there, but it's not linear. So more damage is exactly. not even close to mean more right. growth. And, well, and that's been so very well known. Controlled, like we talked about on, on the Barbell Shrug podcast, there's so many more things that need to be controlled before there can be a one-to-one relationship, right? And then that's, but that changes over time too. Sure. So when you're a first year of training, and you're ten year into training, the mechanisms probably are, are quite different. Right. Um, we one of the things that we looked at is we looked at some of the proteins associated with the post-exercise anabolic window, yep. right? And so some of our preliminary data suggests that that is quite different between the fiber types. And so there's a famous protein people are, you know, again, mTOR, right? Mm-hmm. And some people are aware of this thing called AMPK. Mm-hmm. AMPK, particularly if you did, say, endurance training, mm-hmm. that that blocks mTOR. Right? Well, now the data on that concurrent stuff is actually very, very confusing as well because so that's, that's not how simple I want to go deep into that. So We can, we can go there. Yeah. Um, but my point is AMPK can activate another series of proteins when, and it eventually acts, activates a substrate called TCBD1 and TCBD1. B, C, D, D4. Terrible, terrible biology sure. names. But those are the things that are responsible in large part for the post-exercise increasing of, of glucose back into the cell and things like that, which is what people tend to call the so post-exercise. So is stimulating Eventually, okay. yeah, right? So it's metabolic. Yep. Right, it's driven. It's not anabolic, yep. generally, but it's metabolic. So the window in which it's activated seems to be a lot different between the fiber types. And we're only preliminary, so I can't I give you a number. When you say when you mean like the time? That's right. right. So what, what we think happens here is it's possible that the window post-exercise that it's important to get nutrients in differs between how many fiber types you have. Uh, so what kind example, of fiber so types you have. Which faster uptake? Well, so here's what Speculate. we're trying to work through, through right? Is we've, we've tagged this out now up to four hours post. And I'm sure you're aware of most of the data on the post-exercise anabolic window. It's like, well, it's more like a big garage, right? Right. Well, I think it may be, but it might be a real tight window depending on your fiber type. But we just got to get through more of the data to figure this stuff out. Um, but your, your inclinations are pretty good there with, with yeah, what it's going to be. So, But, you know, I don't know. Like, but this is the type of stuff we can get into when we start looking you have, at these you have mechanisms. You speculate a fast-twitch muscle fiber is bigger. It's going to be more metabolically demanding. It's going to be creating more energy expenditure yeah. thereby it's probably going to have a greater well we published this system. uh seven or eight years ago now but i looked at some of the molecular mechanisms for hypertrophy mm-hmm. in the fiber types just at rest not not in any response and it's very very clear the fast twitch muscle fibers it's not an activation issue it's not i should say it's not entirely an activation issue because when you isolate the fibers out and you just measure them you take nerve out of it the fast twitch muscle fibers have a lot more of the molecules that induce hypertrophy there's, they're there to higher concentration. They're more sensitive. Their basal activation is much higher. same molecules that activate hypertrophy. What are you talking about? So signaling proteins. Again, anything in your mTOR, mTOR yep. AKT, anything in that, that PSA, PS70, S6 kinase line, any of those things, right? I just collectively call them anabolic signaling stuff. Yep. Uh, we've got this at the genetic level as well, but particularly, they're, they're more there. So I think it's very accurate to say you're going to have a very different response between those fiber types. It's very, very clear. And some of it may be a result of activation, but some of it could simply be just the nature of fast-twitch fibers are more inherently there to hypertrophy. Exactly. Like yeah. that's, that's just more that's of the, That's why you have a differentiation between right. them is they're there to serve different purposes. Right. If you go really far down one training into the spectrum and you spend 10 or 12 years or whatever happened, I made that number up sure. for a long time, specifying one of those things, it's going to get really close to its potential. If you don't, though, it's going to get left behind. So with the bodybuilding, man, I don't know. Like, I don't really know if it is an advantage or if you have more advantage saying, oh, we've already peaked you out here. Now let's go back and work on the other fibers. Mm-hmm. Or if it's better to go to hell with these, let's just abandon them and let's get really fast twitch. Let's specialize in fast twitch and then get those ones as big as we possibly can. I don't know the answer. to bodybuilding? Well, hypertrophy, right? Anything. Yeah. Just trying to get I mean, bigger, I, right? Yeah. Because I mean, I have, I have my, my guess what that would be. Based on the way that I've trained throughout my career, the cycles, like I've done some that's very uh, volume-oriented. I've done some training that's very endurance-oriented. I've done yeah. some training that's very um, fast-twitch-oriented. Yeah. Um, as far as building muscle, I would believe, and you can decide if this is right when you figure this out in a year or two, oh, yeah, yeah. is uh, forget, about, forget about the slow twitch. Forget yeah. Fast twitch. I, I really believe... Um, there's always going to be slow twitch there, right? Sure, you're but not going to really, get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. but I really believe, um, you know, the more I train with very specific high intensity contractions, the faster I grow. Um, there there needs to be there needs to be a component, I believe, of of the metabolic accumulation. But what most people are doing is, is 
you know, by doing what I find by doing too much, like I talked about my hike, yeah. you're almost, you're almost detraining your nervous system's ability to contract. Oh, absolutely. At a high level. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe the more you can, you know, maybe there's a cyclical, maybe there's like a point of diminishing returns where you can't push the, the you know, maybe you have to kind of cycle through, yeah. the, you know, you get up to 70% fast twitch and then you deload and then get, mm-hmm, you know, like, mm-hmm. uh, but I really believe that, um, that strength, like a really hard aggressive contraction is by far the best way to build muscle. Well, a guy I worked with in Sweden, Per Tesh, did some studies in the 80s mm-hmm. on bodybuilders with biopsy stuff, but nothing's been done since then. And unfortunately, the methods they used for fiber typing are now, now we know oh, just sure. not there. So that's actually, I haven't even thought about that, but just simply that study, looking at decently, I mean, elite would be great, but even just decently successful bodybuilders and looking at just what is your fiber type profile? And if, are these people 80? 85% fast twitch, right. that would tell you a lot. And that would say, maybe the problem, don't worry the about problem it. That the problem that what I see the researchers aren't looking at is the subjectivity of the training. So like yeah. just by going, hey, that guy trains heavy. Well, yeah. what, is, what does heavy mean? Yeah. And this is what all the researchers are missing is like, there's no standardization of like, what what does a bicep look like for you and it look like for me? It's very different. So how do you, how do you qualify or quantify comparing this exercise against this, this exercise or this exercise done by this person compared to this, you can't. No. So that, that's why I'm- like, Well, what makes it even giant. worse, man, like this is basically why I have a career, is because I remember getting my PhD and thinking every single study that's used anything anaerobic is all three sets of 10 at 70%. Like, and I'm thinking, I know the difference between weightlifting and powerlifting. I know the difference between fitness and figure and bodybuilding. And like in the research, that's all the same thing. Right. I'm like, are you kidding me? We know that those give you such wildly different actual outcomes. Right. You can't possibly think those are going to have the same physiological response, but yet you lump them all together. And you'll see studies where it compared um, whatever, concurrent training or endurance training to weightlifting. And three of the people were bodybuilders, two of them were jumpers, four of them were weightlifters. And you're like, right. what in the I world? Like, this, is, this is not even, and this is why I started my entire lab and research agenda. This is how I got my job. Because I said, look, we've got to differentiate these things because I got to know how to make somebody strong but not add any muscle mass because I got weight class, yes. right? Yeah. Most of the athletes I work with are all in weight classes, right? Mm-hmm. So I can't afford, I, you can't miss weight. You cut from the UFC if you miss weight, Yeah. right? Basically. Um, but then you got to be able to add mass sometimes too, because even with those athletes, sometimes we have to do that. They're going to go up a weight class or right. they're just undersized or whatever reason. We, we're not even close to differentiating these things out. The coaches, practitioners have a lot better idea it's not that difficult to develop a program that's going to get you strong, but not add a ton of mass or vice versa. But from a science perspective, we're so far behind, right? And that's just because one, we didn't have any scientists that had either the training understanding to know that there's a difference here, or they, if they did, they didn't have the, the technical physiology background enough to really get deep here. Right. And then if you find that together, it's like, oh yeah, find a way to fund that. Like, exactly. good luck, and right? The thought process is always just it's flawed you know and yeah. most of the research is like well it's super short-sighted and you didn't consider that like you know like you're just looking at these populations and you're trying to make inferences from these populations that are completely not related this doesn't make any sense you want to oh this will drive you nuts we just published a study for the first time where we looked at fiber type between the two limbs so this was a vl the, yeah. the quad but we did it in both legs now you assume that the fiber type composition is the same between both right and this is published so i can say all this stuff yeah. And what we did is we said, nobody's tying together movement, strength, function, and physiology yet. So we had people, we biopsied both legs. We had them do a one rep max leg extension on both legs, independent, right? We had them step off of a box, land on two independent force plates, and re-jump, and we captured it in three 60-degree cameras, high depth, and had the force plate reading there. And so I want to look at movement quality, kinetics, kinematics, kinematics and kinetics, as well as physiology, fiber type, and as well as performance. And we wrapped this stuff all together, and what we found was, from a group level, when we did all the statistics and we analyzed everything, the right leg was the dominant leg, right? So when we asked the question of, which, which leg would you prefer to kick a ball with? They all said right leg, right? And so we said, fine. Now, as a group average, the right leg was stronger. It was the one that they was a lot faster. They used it more for the landing and jump, and it had way more slow twitch fibers. Hmm. And they were significantly different between the right and left how's, leg. How significantly different? Massively, right? So you're talking like statistically significant. Yeah. And I don't know what the percentage was, 15%, something like that. Wow. But because I've done this enough, and I went, hmm, like this is not, 
like, I don't, this is, I had the same reaction you had, yeah. right? Like, this is not making any sense. So I started looking back at the individual data, and we have, I think, 15 people in the study. And I started looking through, and I said, literally, is Ben's right leg stronger, and did he have more slow twitch? Oh, no, he didn't. Like, okay, his trust, no, is it? No, and I started looking, only two of our 14 or 15 actually had the group result present in themselves. It was another way of saying, that was a group finding that literally almost didn't exist ever. Not a single person actually had a stronger right leg and had more slow twitch fibers in it. It was a function of the, the math happened to line up that way. Okay. And so when I did the individual analysis, I said, like, this is, a, this is a study finding, but I don't think this really ever exists. And, and if it was, it was only happened two out of 15 people. But it was so strong, it drove the averages. And they were so random uh. that the numbers just lined up that way. So we had to publish it as in, like, this is going to happen. But then I said, but I don't think this is a real finding. This is not practically significant. It's not going to really see it. We saw a lot of people that had very different fiber types between their legs. And that I'm convinced of. But it's a classic example of what you're saying. Like, you have to think. Like, you have to really think. Because so, I'm like, I don't think this is really happening. So here's a perfect example as to why that would happen. So, you know, or, or maybe for me. Um, my legs are big. I can't fit into a leg extension. So I'm yeah. doing a leg extension, it ends up being externally rotated. Yep. Thing, yep. So my quads aren't lining up. Yeah. If I do a single leg leg extension, one leg fits in because I can fit it in perfectly and get proper alignment so it's not yeah. externally rotated. But the other leg still ends up being slightly externally rotated because yep. I can't fit because there's not enough room in the yeah. machine. And now you're talking VL and v versus VL. Completely like, different, completely different yep. muscular recruitment patterns, yep. right? And this is where things like this happen is people aren't paying attention to making sure things are lined up. All of a sudden, that leg's doing something different than this one. You develop a really good competition pattern. So it feels like you're doing about the same thing. Yeah. But and we, we had a really kind of a cheap old leg extension machine too. Mm. It has a, a wing that comes out to one side. And so one side feels great in it. Right. The other side doesn't. It feels like, yeah. yeah, it feels weird, yeah. right? Yeah. We also did a leg extension to max. When's the last time you did a max leg extension? Yeah. I mean, you may be from bodybuilding, well, no. but- can, can they the stabilize the this? hip enough? Like, no way. No way. No way, yeah. right? So we had a bunch of people who don't ever do that exercise. Right. They definitely don't do that heavy. Right. And then we did these things. And so one side feels neurologically really coordinated because it's the dominant side. The other one, like, I've never done this before because usually I'm using more of the dominant leg anyways. Exactly, right? Yeah. It, so but I think it's just the reason I brought that up is that's an example, though, of the physiology is very different. But the physiology was related to function in all of them. But it wasn't necessarily related to strength. Right? So there's more to the picture. I wish we could have measured EMG activation. That was like, when I finished it, I was like, man, I wish we knew. Even that, if I think, is so limited, more, man. I think EMG needs limited. to be uh, evolved. That's why I never do it. Right. I hate it. I think it's never part of my life. People are making these conclusions and these deductive reasoning, and I'm just like, man, unless yeah. you want, like, and this is why I think you guys need to collaborate with, you know, biomechanists and, and yeah. neurophysiologists because um, I'm looking at a study, I'm like, well, that's not true because they're not considering neurophysiology, they're not considering yeah. biomechanics. And until you do, like, all these muscle studies for me are very limited. What you're doing, you're the only guy that I found that's actually putting all the pieces together. You're like, I have to consider all of these variables. And that's why I've been you know, literally bugging you for the last six months. I'm like, hey, dude, you got to get on my podcast. Man, but, that, but that's because <laughs> I come from a training background, too. Yeah. Like, and I'm still thinking, I mean, that's why we did the book, too. I'm like, look, okay, I know I'm a scientist, but I'm telling you, if you're not paying attention to what it feels like, this stuff is all a waste. Because science, th th that study is an exact example, man, of what I'm talking about. Right. That's my own study. And I said, you don't think that's really that real. Because, like, you have to still think. Science, technology can only take you so far. You right. have to feel. So most guys have such an ego, and they come up with a, with, a, with a result, and they're like, oh, this is a different result. It's going to get me a lot of traction. I'm going to put it out there anyways. And they don't want to you know, be honest and go, oh. You know how many people hit me up and were like, dude, you just shot yourself in the foot. It's OK. Like, why did you do that? Yeah, like, why did you put the individual data in there? Because like, like, it's not real. Right. Like, I don't think that that's a real thing. I, I could have gone out there, dude, and just left those group results. Right. And people would have just started doing things all differently. It, it probably changed fitness, man. Right. Which a lot of these studies would have changed research. People would have been right. shooting off with follow-up studies. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, I don't think this is actually really happening. You, man. Integrity. Because it's, it's not there. And I just know from a training, like, I've done enough stuff. I've been enough. I've been lifting my whole life. Right. I'm like, I'm not like, it's just, there's more there. And I'm right. telling you. And it gets hard when you start working with athletes, too. And you realize, that, like, I was fortunate enough to work with some people that, that won gold medals in Rio. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing's, and you're like, you have these people who aren't making any money. They put their life on the line. They've committed everything like you're talking about. They're like, everything 100%. goes away. Yeah. Relationships go away yeah. for a quad, right? Four years of that, and they get one opportunity. And then you, as their coach, let your ego ruin their dream. Right. Like, I couldn't do that. 
So I'm like, to hell with it. I don't care. I'm interested in the answer and nothing else matters. Right. This is gone. And once, once that happened to me, then I'm like, well, why doesn't this go the rest of my life? Why doesn't this go to everything else? And when you start doing that, you start realizing it all switches. And that's when I was like, okay, when the book came along, I'm like, yeah, let's do this because what's really helping people? And it's just, that's why I obviously gravitated to your stuff too. I'm like, yes, man, like who cares about the exercise? Who cares about the numbers? That's not what's important. You've right. got to learn to feel. Yeah. If you don't learn to feel your physiology, and then you can extend that now to your nutrition. And you can extend that to now your, your lifestyle and your habits. What works, what doesn't work. If you don't learn to feel, and we can take this as far as you want from the highest level of the technology of HRV training to a mirror. When I talk to special ops people, when I work with the military people, I'm like, this is what I'm talking about. It's all still got to come back to you. Like, it all has to devolve to your feelings. So when I ever give training recommendations, man, like if you're in my class, they all just, every time they just start laughing because they know the answer is always going to be. It depends. Always. Right. Yeah, you have to cue you up for that, right? Yeah. Like that's what it, it always is. They yeah. always that's know the that's the answer. Everyone just wants, it's just, I don't want to learn how to fish, just give me the fish. Yeah. Just tell me what to do, man. I don't want to think. When that, that's just the unfortunate reality of the fitness industry. Yeah. So well, it only things, takes you so far, man. Right. And you're, you're, <laughs> that's why you're doing such an awesome job, yeah. man. A few more things I want to pick your brain on. Um, AMPK and mTOR. So yeah. this, I know we could probably use seven podcasts on this. Oh, it's, yeah. It's pretty massively extensive. But there's a lot of misconceptions, and most people don't even know what those are. Could you no. give us in you know, the most consensus way possible um, what, what they are and what they do? So I would actually point you to a review article in the Journal of Sports Medicine Great. called, um, well, some of it was called, but it's by my two friends, Jimmy Bagley. He runs a great lab, yeah. lab up at San Francisco. Yeah. He wrote a really nice review article. So if you want more detail, Perfect. you can go to that thing. I'll give you the quick version. Great. So the way that your muscles work is some stimulus happens, okay? And you have a, a cell wall, and you have to communicate information from outside of the cell to the nucleus. The nucleus is what tells you to grow, repair, shrink, die, right. whatever you want to do. Right. And the way that you physically transmit that signal from the outside to the inside is through a process called signaling proteins. Mm -hmm. Their whole job is to communicate signal. So some of those signal to the nucleus that says we need to ramp up, say, mitochondria, which is what you use oxygen for to make energy. Or we need to grow muscle mass, in this particular case. So mTOR is one of the signaling proteins that tells you to grow muscle size. Um, AMPK is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. It is a metabolic thing. It's, it's heavily involved in diabetes. It's heavily involved in, in metabolism energy regulation. It is called the master sensor of energy in your body. It has more of a role generally in aerobic exercise, endurance exercise. Well, for a lot of years, actually dates back to 1980, a uh, famous study by Hickson, we came up with this idea that there's an interference effect. So if you activate now, we have the cellular physiology to explain what Hickson found just from a training perspective. But AMPK is thought to be able to activate another protein called TSC2, and that protein blocks mTOR. And this is when the whole idea came about that if you do too much endurance exercise, it will physiologically block the signals right. that cause muscle hypertrophy. And it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, right? No doubt. Like if, you're, if you're doing this endurance stuff, let's stop building muscle because we want to be better at this efficiency. Anabolic, place. catabolic. Yeah. It's not that complicated. Right. You're growing or you're not, right? Mm -hmm. Are you an energy surplus? You're going to be anabolic. If you're an energy, what's the opposite of surplus? I don't know. The negative uh, yeah, state? Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah, depleted. Yeah, you're not going to grow. Like, right. Why would you send a signal to be anabolic when you need to make more energy? Mm -hmm. So it's not a, like, it's not a complicated, this is a good thing, right. right? Back and forth. Where it's complicated is a lot of the things, it's context. So in other words, if you took your level of fitness and um, you're really unfit, all right, uh, relative to yourself, and you do a little bit of endurance exercise, well, that actually is a very, very different challenge than somebody who's a lot more fit mm -hmm. and does the same thing. Right. So, I mean, when you take it to the extremes, it's sort of like, okay, so that means I can't do a 10-minute warm-up on the treadmill before I go lift. That's probably not blocking your gains, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, you're probably fine there. Right. So we're still trying to figure this out because the data are very apparently conflicting. They're not actually that conflicting. When you get down, you start to realize, like, okay, well, this is done when untrained people, or this study was done in highly trained people, or this was done in, this was their mode of aerobic exercise, et cetera. So there is merit to this stuff, um, but it is a bit confusing. But it really honestly comes down to context. If you're doing something that burns a lot of energy, it's probably not helping a ton of mass grind. Right. Like that's really, I think, as complicated as it really has to be. If you want more detail, go read Jimmy's article. But like, yeah, so don't over-confuse so, those things. So any thoughts about, um, similar to the 1980s study, 
like let's say I'm doing a, a hypertrophy focus workout where yep. I know I'm attempt, attempting to stimulate mTOR. Okay. Uh, and I finish with cardio. Yeah. After a workout. So it just depends on how high of a level you are and what kind of cardio you finish with. So those are the next follow-up questions I would have, right? So are you kind of, uh, are you 23 years old? You're not doing much else? Or you have a job? Uh, are you getting massages every day? Are you, what are the recovery tools you, all this stuff plays into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the classic dogma would say that endurance exercise at the end of your lift is not gonna help, right? It's not gonna help me build muscle, but is it gonna stimulate more AMPK? It probably will. Right. So It'll probably ramp it up, which would then probably block the mTOR. Yeah, so it's generally going to be something that's um, not looked up as a good thing. But this, it comes down to your nutrition too, depending on how much carbohydrate and fat you eat and right. protein, that's going to influence that as well. So, so it's you're not, an energetically, energetic surplus. Yeah. You're more likely to be stimulating uh, mTOR than NPK. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're there, and this is when post-exercise nutrition mm -hmm. or, or peri or pre-exercise nutrition comes in as well. Mm -hmm. You can help that process because protein itself is anabolic. Mm -hmm. right? Independent of, of anything else, it, it can be anabolic. Uh, carbohydrate is the cellular fuel that you actually use to go through the protein synthesis process. Yep. So it's very important as well. Right? There, yeah. You have those two things. If those things are available at a good number before you even start training, then it actually becomes, makes the process. You're much more likely to stay anabolic right? if that stuff is available. So let's say, hypothetically, I come in, I do a heavy hypertrophy workout, I yeah. do an hour of cardio, I immediately take some protein. My body went from mTOR to MBK back to mTOR. So now you're washing yourself dead. Now you're in a confusion of who knows what's going on. Right. Like, you don't know. Some people probably can get away with that. I'm sure, I mean, physiology is so different. I would never say things don't yeah, work for somebody. Be, right. Never. Like, that. those words never go out of my mouth. But generally, that's, you're going to have to say from what we know now, probably not a smart idea. So, the, the, I'll put it this way. The research suggests that, that mTOR is peaked for about four hours. Okay. So if you wanted to do both those things for whatever reason, make you would be best hours. to split them by at least four hours. Now, me personally say, well, then why don't you hedge your bets and make it six or eight hours? Like, make sure that, because your sure. mTOR may be maybe a little, six is the average, right? Or four is the average. Right. So make it six to eight if that's your concern. Or best case, can you do it on a different day entirely? Mm -hmm. Can you do your cardio on a different day, right? Split so, those things so out. So if you had an opportunity to do so you had a desire to build muscle and lose fat. You want to do both in the same day. Knowing what you know, would you do cardio in the morning, you know, wait your few hours to let that AMPK stimulus go and then train and have mTOR? Or would you do it the opposite where mTOR, like would you want to finish your day with an mTOR stimulus or would you want to well, finish your day with an so MTOR Well, so here's what's hard. Because remember, the, in some regards, the body does know day to day, but some regards it doesn't. it doesn't. So like what is in your head a different day and your body is not necessarily. Now sure. we do have but clear you know differences. eight hour Completion window of sleeping, like how is that influencing? It? Have we ever studied that? No, man. Like yeah. this is these are all great questions. Right. We don't have anything close to answers here. Um, what I would say is, I would actually go back a bunch of steps and say, if your goal is to try to put on muscle and lose some fat, that wouldn't be my approach. Like my approach would be, okay, what are you really trying to do? How much mass? I mean, if you're talking like a competitive bodybuilder, mm -hmm. or you're talking about the average person who's like, I just want to add some muscle and lose some fat. Those are different answers. So I'm not gonna give the same recommendation to both those people, not even close. The average person, I would say, well, just spend time getting muscle and then get to the muscle point that you wanna to get to and then lose fat. Because now the easiest way to lose fat is just come down on calories. Right. Like just, just manage the calories a little bit, uh, adding probably more high you know intensity we're go conditioning. We're gonna go there in that conversation now too, because we had a great conversation about calories. Uh, right, well. We gotta go there. But yeah, we'll, we'll I mean like, let's be real here. You wanna lose fat, that's a lot easier on the table than it is in the training room. Right. It's a lot easier. So that easily shifts us into your conversation about this book. So you've got yeah. an awesome book out, Unplugged. Tell me about it. So it's called Unplugged, Evolve from Technology to Upgrade Your Fitness, Performance, and Consciousness. And the, Man, I love that, by the way. Like that, that you're, you're like ringing the bell for me three times right there. Yeah. I'm like, you know, three high fives, man. With the word consciousness, what we're really trying to get at too is think of it like awareness. Yeah. Like I just want you to be aware. Pay attention. You can do whatever choice you want. Right. I just want you to even know that you're making that choice. Yeah, exactly. Like that's honestly, if I could give you the- Nothing mindless, right? Nothing love, mindless. Because everyone does everything mindlessly. So whether yeah. that's in training, it, nutrition, all this stuff. You know the research I'm sure this is not after 35 years old, 95% of your life is unconscious. It's bananas. Really? Yeah. Wow. I wish I knew that for the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess one easy way to think about it is, in the book I set up this idea that I, that I hawk a lot, which is 
there are two things happening, which is adaptation and optimization. And you cannot do those two things at the same time. Uh, teach me about that. So if you're trying to optimize everything, and this is what drives me nuts sometimes about the supplement industry, about the hacking industry, about uh, any of these things, if you're trying to optimize, make everything feel the best, you're limiting and you're blocking adaptation. We can go to cellular physiology here, right? If you're trying to do something, inflammation, right? Inflammation, good or bad? Depends. You cannot adapt. You right. cannot grow muscle without inflammation. Right. That is an inflammatory process. Right. So if you do your workout and then you take anti-inflammatories, you take antioxidants, you do everything possible to reduce inflammation, right. do you know what you also did? Blocked adaptation. You blocked adaptation, right? And the evidence uh, like ice baths, they're really clear, right? Some cool studies have been done. You jump in an ice bath after lifting session, you block hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. You don't grow muscle. And so you have to understand, I'm not saying don't do those things because there's plenty of times when you might train and then you might go, boy, I went too far here. Let me get nice right now because I, I'm not worried about adaptation. I overshot How long do we need to subject our body to the adaptation response? So obviously we know I'm training or I'm doing something hard. Do I, does it need to be four hours? Does it need to be 12 hours? Should it be pretty subjective? It's super subjective. It depends on your training level. At 33, it's different than 23. A man's different than a woman. If you've got the rest of your life under control, then you can, you're allowed a lot more of a little leeway, right? right? If you don't, then your window is very, very small. You can only handle a little bit of stress. And my, my point is, if you have a well-designed program, in this case, you then understand what you're trying to be doing in this part of your program. So let's, I'll use an example. Let's say you had a month block and you're trying to, to get as big as possible, okay? If you have that understanding and say, what is the real goal of this month? What's the real goal of this week? What's the real goal of this day? What's the real goal of this workout? What's the goal of this exact exercise? Right. Then you have a consciousness. You have an awareness of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And you can say, okay, the goal of this boom, 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 up the ladder to the month is to grow as much as I possibly can in this month. Fantastic. Then you should be making whatever choices you can to maximize anabolic growth. Period, right? Period. At the same time, that's an optimization strategy. Then the next block has to go to, this is a peaking phase. You're not trying to grow during peaking phase, right? You can't be, because you're trying to now cause the other end of the spectrum, right? You're either causing adaptation, this is a classic bodybuilding, in the off season we bulk up as high as we can mm -hmm. get, right? And then we get closer to competition, what do we do? Mm -hmm. We don't optimize. Are you overeating calories when you're trying to get Man, close? It's such a great thing for people to hear because how many guys do you know that change their goal on a week to week basis? Like Monday to Thursday, I'm trying to grow, but I get to Thursday night, I'm like, shit, I want to look good at the bar on the weekend. Boom, right? Right, I'm like, I got to shred for two days. No, I mean, <laughs> you get there all the time. Like, uh, I talk about the same thing with nootropics, coffee, uh, you name your thing, sleep, okay? I was with um, to some guys uh, last week, and they're like, well, I'm talking about recovery. I'm like, why are, why are you so convinced you want to maximize recovery at all times? And I'm like, well, why wouldn't I want to recover? Because you know the less you recovered, the more you're adapting. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. So you let those signals stay around for a while, that's more signal to adapt. Interesting. Right? So Interesting. If, you, if you get off of the, get out, get out of the weight room and you start maximizing recovery, you minimize the time that your body was told to adapt. So I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying, again, have that awareness of going, what's the real goal? And if you have that awareness, then you can still choose to maximize sure. recovery, but then you realize that you're cutting down adaptation. Mm. So, man, that's amazing, because that, this is one thing that I've... I've preached for a long time is like Monday to Friday, 100% focus on hypertrophy. Like I want yeah. you to get as big as possible, create as much muscle damage as possible, and then take two days off. I've always found that to be uh, most bodybuilders or most people aspiring to have a great physique um, don't take as many consecutive days off as they need to. Mm -hmm. So like one day is probably not enough to optimize recovery. To Once optimize you get to a decent this, level, yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. Like so – you know, the best best training programs I've seen are people going five days in a row and then taking two days completely off. Yeah. You know, and so those two days are focused on this recovery thing. Yeah. Whereas during the, during the week, we're going like hard on this. It seems to fit your thought process. Rather well, than like maybe on a small three on, one, one yeah. off, two on, one off kind of thing. You know, what do you think? Yeah, you can. I mean, I would say that... You think you need longer for the... the... I, I would say, honestly, I don't know. You, I would defer to you back on this one mm -hmm. because that's... Uh, I don't have that experience. You know, I, I can't say that. I can say from a bigger, more zoomed out level, 
but I'm not act, I'm not gonna act like yeah, I've been on that many. Yeah, totally. Boxes. I'm just saying yeah. I want to create a massive amount of stress. Like you know, you're pushing yeah. the overreaching phase, and then I want you to recover. Most people don't give themselves that two, three. I would four say days I would say recovery. zoom out even bigger though, okay. bigger bigger blocks. So my NFL guy. Uh, so they the, in the NFL they go through. Right now the combine just got over, okay, and they're gonna go through OTAs are coming up. Uh, they got a report in a month, and then they go through a really hard training camp, and the season starts, right? So we break it down, and I'm like, okay, fish oil. Super awesome anti-inflammatory. He's now, right now, he's working hard. He's going to start working hard to try to get ready, because he's kind of like on the roster, off the roster. Like, he's yeah. one of these guys, right? We need to get you better. I'm not going to let you maximize recovery right now. you got to get better. But when training camp hits, and training camp's really physically hard on them, then we're gonna load up on fish oil because you're not trying to get better during training camp. You're trying to recover. Right. Because you gotta get going the next day, next day, next day. That makes so much sense. So I zoom out and look at it in more of like a classic periodization style across mesos over the year, over the month, over the, the, the quad in, for our Olympian and say, okay, this year is an adaptation year. And we're gonna try to get you better for this meet or whatever, but we're doing the things that cause long-term adaptation right now. Next year, the six months before Rio or London or wherever we're going, we're gonna really up the recovery stuff because you gotta recover from all these, this two years of micro trauma. How long do you need to recover? Let's, so let's say I do like a six month in, or four month intensive hypertrophy, like I'm doing everything I can yeah. to adapt. Yep. How long do I need to let my entire body to, obviously it's a subjective thing, but from your opinion. Yeah, well, you know, like a general, a pretty good rule of thumb is six weeks to one. So six weeks of really hard training takes about one more week. And that, and that really goes up and down the spectrum, but it's yeah. pretty good. So yeah. you, you put you put six months into the game, like I would say you need a month. A month. I Generally, totally that. it yeah, depends I mean, on you. So you got steroids, like that's a different game, game, all that stuff. I trained for the Olympia for six months, and uh, it took me at least six weeks before yeah. I felt normal, like before my brain worked, before like I was actually able to be a normal. No, human yeah, being. I believe that's it. Because I, I was pushing so hard. Yeah. Uh, like way more than I'd ever done, you know. And, and as as a bodybuilder, you attached to. The last thing I want to do is show up unprepared. So I'll definitely over-prepare. I get it. Do I work right. with, with UFC fighters? Right. Same, the, 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 they would rather get knocked out because they're overtrained in the first 10 seconds and they would lose the decision because they got tired. Like, there's no way that they can under... That, that's not even in the conversation. Right. So, like, trying to have that conversation is, is not going to... It's interesting, but I, I want... Yeah, so my, my focus is always... I know I left myself four days before the contest, which is obviously not enough to do this optimization time. Like, yeah. how, how quickly can I, you know, get all this inflammation out? And it's probably more of like two weeks. So Dorian Yates is yeah. brilliant. Yeah, he said for, you know, he, he stopped cardio four weeks out from the contest. Yeah. And, you know, so he started cardio is 12 or 16 weeks out and did a little bit. And then four weeks out, he stopped. And he's decreased the training, increased the posing. Like, he's like, I'm, I'm adapted. I, yeah, I, yeah. You know, use your terms. I'm, I'm a, I just want to maintain this and mm -hmm. allow my body to recover. So when I go on stage, I'm at this like, and nobody did it better than that guy. Yeah, right? Nobody blew up like him and... That's why he's one of the greats of all time, right? Yeah, greatest. Yeah. But like we can, we, I, I like to extend this stuff out to other stuff too. So like, let's look at your lifestyle habits. Mm -hmm. Let's look at all the rest of the things that are going on. So if you're using um, a pre-workout or coffee, right? Whatever it happens to be. And you're using that to get started in your training. Well, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to need more. You're going to need more, right? Yeah. That should be telling you something. That your body is saying, right. We're not here. Like, we're, I'm not, I don't want to do this. You're always working on borrowed energy, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Now, you're optimizing. Yeah. You're optimizing. You need to then, maybe after your competition, go, you know what? Okay, boom. Nootropics out. Stimulus out. Whatever it happens to yeah, me. Yeah. The music's out. Whatever. And I'm going to learn. And you know what's going to happen to your performance? It's going to go down for a little yes. bit. And your workouts are going to suck. Yeah. They're not going to be as good. But you're, you're causing, you're getting better right here, right. right? If you're optimizing at all time, and if your lifestyle, right? If you have to wake up in the morning, and it takes you 45 minutes to do a meditation session. Then you have to have your, your butter and your coffee. And, you, and there's like a four and a half hour step to get ready to answer a fucking email. Right. I'm like, okay, great. Some days do that. Some days I want you to feel amazing. Mobilize, get the joints going, all that stuff. But have the awareness to go, you know what? I'm going to choose suffering. I'm going to wake up and I know I'm better when I do my breathing drills. But today, I'm going to execute and I'm not going to have coffee today or whatever your jam is. It does, I'm not I'm knocking sure. against any of these things, right? And I'm still going to extra the cube. And you know you're going to have maybe a little bit of a grind today. Maybe you don't take as many meetings or something. Or maybe you do. And you go, you know what? Today is a mental day where I'm going to finish today. I'm going to get it done. And I'm not going to have that. And then you, and actually, I like it when people know what makes them feel best. I like it when people know, hey, if I do this, this, and this, that's my best. That's a good trait to have. Right. But don't always choose that. You have to choose suffering sometimes. Beautiful, man.
so much to it. Yeah. Um, I think that book sounds amazing. Is there anything else in there that you want to touch on in that book before I ask you one final question? Oh, there's probably a thousand more things, um, but it's a, it's a high level thing, right? So it's these types of things and it's trying to get people to think that consciousness piece, right? Um, it, it really is more also a, a book about training technologies. So uh, heart rate monitors, all that type of stuff, how you can use that, everything from a video, from movement quality. It's similar to what you're saying, Matt, about you can use EMG tracker, you can use software. Um, there's a company that I worked with at one point that you can put a compression shorts on and I'll tell you which muscles activated and all these things, right? Interesting. Well, your reaction there is, is perfect. Yeah. Because like you know, what you know about surface EMG, right? Yeah. What I really want to say here is just because a company has $100 million into something, it might be an amazing technology, but it doesn't necessarily make it a good training product. Right. So be very, very careful of this technology. I'm not anti any of these techs. Sure. I'm not anti it's coffee. I'm not anti any of these things. Right. What I am is pro awareness. Right. Think about what you're feeling. If these things don't translate into feeling, they don't mean shit. So use tech if it helps you learn your body better, but don't let it become a taskmaster. Just use it as a tool. That's it. Amazing. So one final thing, man. I want, I want to talk about this lactate conversation that people oh, yeah. are confusing. And we got we got sure. to touch on that because you're you're the best you're the best at articulating what exactly is happening. What's the misunderstanding? What is lactate? What is lactic acid? And what what, what do people need to know? So if you want a like a two hour version of this, I have a free video up. Actually, all my videos are free. So you can go watch. I, I gave a whole physiology of fat loss. Awesome. Walk you through the whole thing on there. It's and it's two hours. Yeah, no, it's legit. Um, what I do is all my class material, all my lectures, anytime I speak at a conference, mm -hmm. I just put it up on my website free. So everything's free. You can't even, there's no newsletter, there's no membership. I'm, I'm just, it's all free there. So it's all up there. Uh, and I have, I think a, I have a five minute lactate version and I have a hour plus change of lactate as well. Okay, so, so that's we'll all up there. We'll link to that in the show notes for sure. Yeah, so that's all up there, but the quick version. Yeah. Um, Lactate is a byproduct of carbohydrate metabolism. Mm -hmm. So when you use glucose or, or glycogen for fuel, um, the easy way is this. Glucose is made of six carbons. And if you're watching the video, this is gonna be a, a lot easier to think of, right? So six carbons, okay? When you go through glycolysis, when you break it down, it gets split into half, right? So you have a three carbon and a three carbon. Mm -hmm. That's very fast, very good. Now, when you go to do that next step, and you break those three carbon molecules down, you'll break the, it's, it's called pyruvate, all right? Well, in order to move on from there, you have to have oxygen around. It has to be shipped in the mitochondria, okay? If you don't have that around, you have a free-floating hydrogen. Free-floating hydrogen is acid. What ends up happening is you attach that free-floating hydrogen onto that three carbon molecule pyruvate. When you take pyruvate and add a hydrogen to it, it's now called lactate. So that's all it is. It's one, it is half of a sugar molecule. And this is a really simplified version of it, but you get the basic idea. Right. So where, where people get off on that is, in that form is lactic acid, but it really gets quickly dissociated into lactate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not an acid in human physiology. Now it is highly associated with muscle fatigue. In other words, when you get muscle fatigued, you have a lot of lactate because you're using a lot of glucose for energy. And that is a very quick byproduct of it. But it, what it doesn't do is cause muscle soreness. It does not cause fatigue. Right. In fact, it is, um, if you look at George Brooks at Cal, uh, the pioneer with lactate, he's the one that told us all this information I'm about to spew. So all credit to George and his phenomenal lab. But you can actually use it as a tremendous fuel for exercise. It is a preferred fuel, actually. Right. The brain often prefers lactate over anything else. Um, if you actually get like an IV or a supplement of lactate, it will choose lactate over glucose for fuel. Because mm -hmm. um, what happens is it is a half a sugar. Right? It is de-acidifying you. Right. It is stopping you from becoming acidic. Is well, well, the fancy because word is because it's binding to that hydrogen, which is it's an intracellular buffer. Right. Right. It's holding you from becoming acidic. You can transport it to either the next muscle fiber that's not contracting, a whole another muscle. You can transport it to the heart. You can transport it um, to some of your organs and make new sugar from them. And go through gluconeogenesis. So it is a fuel. And what George is, his lab has shown is it's probably the most important signaling molecule. And so what he calls it as lactohormone. It is a hormone. Now, it's not classically a hormone, but it functions like a hormone almost more than any other hormone does. And so I think the misconception is people need to stop thinking about it like a waste product and start thinking about it as an extremely effective communication tool. That's how you know to turn on aerobic metabolism. Right? That's a very, so very good thing. Increasing heart rate. Or being more efficient. 
Okay. So that's when you know, this is when you know to start ventilating more, right? This is when you know to start feeling, uh, to start using more aerobic metabolism, which is um, uh, less wasteful, if right. you put it that way. Is there any correlation between uh, high levels of lactate and uh, fat loss or growth hormone secretion? Well, there's a relationship there because remember, growth hormone is metabolic, right? Mm -hmm. Lipolysis is the primary function of growth hormone. Mm -hmm. It's not primary function, it's not anabolism, right? Right. It is there. So there's absolutely there. And in fact, this is what some people are probably going to say is, its signaling property of lactate is to do things like that. That's how those fat cells know how to do stuff, right? It's being communicated too. So muscle is an endocrine organ. Now fat is too, but on a smaller scale. And endocrine organ me, it sends out information. It's not dumb. Right. It's not just getting information and doing things. Right. It is communicating with the rest of the body and telling it what to do. And so it's, there's definitely a relationship there, but don't confuse causation with correlation there. Right, so is there a correlation? So most people for say sure. increased lactate is going to give you a higher amount of growth hormone secretion. Not true. Well, I mean, the, the bigger question would be, why do you even care? Well, if we're trying to create um, growth hormone production to increase lipolysis. Yeah, but why do you care about increasing lipolysis? You're assuming that more lipolysis means more fat loss, right? Which is a false assumption. Okay. So, like, this is why I said, like, it depends on what you mean by it. If you think that that's going to then more like, see, lipolysis is not the rate limiting step. It's oxidation. oxidation. So you can lipolysize more. You can take a fat burner all you want, but that doesn't mean you lose fat. Fat burning is not associated with fat loss. I mean, well, there's an association there, but that's not the same thing because you, your carnitine levels are going to limit how much fat you can get in, depending on what type of fatty acid you have, right? Right. So that's why I ask, like, why do you care? If you're asking me, really, is higher intensity exercise generally better for fat loss? And low intensity exercise, generally, yes. So if you understand the physiology of it, fine. If you're confused in the physiology of it, fine. Are you doing the right thing training-wise? That's probably what you care about more. Right. Is, is carnitine supplementation uh, a useful tool? That's it, man. We've done, we did some research maybe 12 years ago on that. And back then, GPLC stuff was better. But the carnitine jam, they're having, they still have a hard time with getting that stuff in the muscle and getting it in the fibers. It's probably a lot better now. Intravenous? So that you can get uh, you can get carnitine IV. Uh, no, we're just taking a, a okay. standard pill. Um, but the problem is, by the time it gets in the system, by the time it gets actually in the muscle, because it's a chronic thing, right? It's not an acute thing. You can't take it like pre-workout and all of a sudden feel feel jazzed, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to get in the muscle. It's got to get into the mitochondrial wall mm -hmm. and allow you to actually get fatty acid in the cell. Um, I haven't kept up to date with the research on carnitine in probably five years, so I will defer to if I'm wrong here. I apologize, but. When we were doing it, the studies we did, when we published in that area, the product we tested was better, but most of them just really had a hard time working. Um, you can show things like increased lipolysis, but again, it's sort of a magic trick, right? because it doesn't necessarily mean more fat loss. So as far as I know, they're, just, they're not particularly so great. It's correlated with more fat loss, just more work. More work, man. Yeah. More work, less eating. Efficiency. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's brown fat is, is helpful too, but... Um, it's, it's, it's not particularly complicated. If you watch that that 55 minute physiology video I have on fat loss, you gotta. I mean, I, we don't have the time here, but I could walk you through the metabolism of fat loss. It's actually very similar. Like it's a carbon issue, right? And the calorie issue is sort of a tertiary thing, right? Uh, you at have best. A video on it? Yeah, it's it's super long. Like, it's very very long. So I got a five minute vision. Five minute video version of the fat loss. Okay. And I got a 55 one there. So, so link to both of them in the show. So you guys can check that out at vampikolsky.com slash podcast. Dude, I'm gonna give you a hug, man. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. That was amazing. Glad to connect, man. Dude, Dr. Finally. Andy Galpin finally got this guy on there, and you see why I've been bugging him for so many months. He's a busy man. We finally got to connect. Amazing. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the show. And if you enjoy it, we would appreciate a share and review and Dr. Andy Galpin on social media and the book Unplugged. Yeah. Definitely Andy, get his book. AndyGalpin.com. Pretty easy. Enjoy your day. Pipes. Thanks awesome, man. Thanks. Great, man. Dude, so good. So great. So great.